Hi there! Previously we discussed how we can evaluate data quality and models quality in monitoring. Now it's time to discuss data drift. So what is data drift and when should we care about it? At the very beginning we discussed that together with service health we should start our monitoring from model quality metrics and business KPIs because it's a very strong signal of potential problem with the models. Unfortunately, for quite a lot of cases, we cannot calculate model's quality straight ahead. Why so? Because quite often we have our ground truth delayed, and in this case we cannot just calculate model's quality because we just do not have enough data at hand. In this case, it makes sense to come up with some proxy metrics, which will serve us as a potential signal of the model performance decay. So let's take a look at such metrics. And first metric I want to bring up here is prediction drift. Here the idea is to compare the model's output on top of the reference data with the model's output on top of the current batch of data. And we compare such outputs by comparing their distributions. So why should we care about prediction drift? Let's take a look at the example of fraud detection. Imagine then just out of the blue your model started to predict fraud more often. How can we interpret that? So basically, if we see that there are some changes in the model's output, it can happen because the um, environment has changed. So maybe we have some changes in the input features. Or maybe there are some data quality bugs, like broken prediction pipelines, broken pipelines for data preprocessing, or maybe even some bugs in the source data. So this is why prediction drift is quite strong signal of potential problems with the model. The other good proxy metrics are feature drifts. So we can use the same idea and compare the distributions of our input features on top of the reference dataset and the current batch of data. Basically, we need to care about features drift because our assumption we use to train the model is that, well, we learn some pattern from the training data and then we use those patterns over the new batches of data in order to generate some outputs. And if there are quite small changes in the distributions of input features, well, that's probably okay, especially if our model is robust enough and can extrapolate well. But what if we have quite strong changes in the input features? In this case, we can face significant model's quality drop. So how we can use the information about prediction drift and feature drift? Imagine that we detected our model's quality drop, for example, on the third week of production usage of the model. What if together with the model's quality we measured ELSA feature drift? In this case, we can come up with the calculations like for example, share of drifted features, right? Because it's much easier to track the share of drifted features, especially if you have quite a lot of feature, then the individual features drift and have a lot of alerts. So if we see that there are quite a lot of features drifting, then probably that's an early signal of potential model's quality drop. So maybe it's a good idea to start analysis after we see that there are quite a lot of drifted features, and then probably we will be able to prevent the model quality drop. So the idea is to measure this metric as the proxy and maybe use it as an early monitoring for potential model's quality issues. So there are some important considerations related to data drift. And first is, in most cases, prediction drift is more important than feature drifts. If you need to start from something, then definitely start from prediction drift. Actually, the whole idea of data drift in machine learning is just an heuristic. So there is no an objective drift. There is no the best data drift metrics, there is no right data drift metrics. It's always case and data specific. Not all the distribution drift leads to immediate model performance decay. If, for example, you build your model on top of like thousands of quite weak features, then if like two or three or even ten of your features are drifting, then probably your model will be able to survive it. So not all data drifts are so important. Actually, you don't always have to monitor for data drift. 
because it's very useful for some business critical models, especially if they have delayed feedback. But if you are able to calculate models quality in real time and you have quite a lot of other metrics, maybe you can live perfectly without any drift calculation. But quite often data drift help with debugging, because if you see that there are some problems with data quality or maybe some problems with the model quality, then data drift can be an answer which can help you to figure out what exactly has changed, so what features are drifting or maybe the model's output has changed or whatever. So this is the good way of doing your debugging. And finally, data drift detection might be variable if you do have some labels. I mean, even if you are able to measure model's quality directly, data drift can be quite useful, uh, helping you figure out how much changes you evaluated on top of whole data set and maybe be a good trigger for maybe starting some experiments with model retraining and maybe potentially train a better model than one that you already have in production. So we have a quite nice tutorial I want to share with you, which is called how to break a model in 20 days. And if you need to calculate data drift, I suggest you to take a look. There we explore how data drift can help with detection models quality drop earlier. How we can detect data drift. There are quite a lot of drift detection methods, such as statistical tests, some probabilistic distance metrics, heuristics, rules, and etc. In order to detect whether this particular feature drifted or not, we need to have some drift detection threshold, and those thresholds can be very different depending on the drift detection methods. For example, it can be p-value for some statistical tests or numeric threshold for drift distance metrics. If we use the distribution comparison idea as the drift detection method, then we need to have reference dataset because it will be a basis of our comparison. And finally, if we do have quite a lot of machine learning models in production, which uses a lot of features, then we need to have some alerting conditions because you definitely do, want, do not want to have an alert after each feature drifted, especially if your drift detection method, methods are very sensitive and you have quite a lot of weak features. So let's discuss all these topics one by one. And first is how we identify that our data has drifted. Well, there are several approach. I'm going to bring up three the most wide used. So first is statistical tests. You can use parametric or non-parametric tests to compare your distributions. Actually, if you do not have reference data, you can even use some one sample statistical tests. For example, if you can assume that your data have a specific distribution or if you can check it and you can compare some parameters of the distributions of your features with some known values. For example, like compare whether the mean value for this particular feature is equal to 10, for example. For doing that, you don't really need to have a reference data. But in the standard cases, you need to have the reference data, current data, and you need to select the right statistical test parametric or non-parametric to compare the distribution. Generally, parametric tests are more sensitive, but non-parametric tests are less demanding in terms of the data. In this case, most likely you will be using p-value as the measure of confidence of the drift detection. The other approach is distance-based, and here you can use any metric which serve as the distribution comparison metric. For example, it can be Wasserstein distance or population stability index. These metrics are much better for a larger data set and in this case, instead of p-value, you will be able to get a score like distance or divergence or level of similarity. And finally, if you have some good ideas of what means drift for your specific features, for example, if you uh, know that you can expect some specific changes like the new category added to your categorical value, then instead of statistical tests or distance-based metrics, you can come up with your own rule-based heuristics, I mean checks, which you can apply to some features like new category appeared or maybe important category disappeared. 
Here is an example of how the visualization of drift detection check can look like. So this is an example from Evidently Library, where you can see that the drift is detected for numerical feature. There is a distribution, there is a value of the feature in time, and here we used statistical test Kolmogorov-Smirnov because the sample size was, was small enough to do that. For categorical features, we can use methods like Keysquare, even if uh, the size of dataset is not too big. And if you have, for example, binary categorical features, then we can do even better and use some proportional different tests, like, for example, Z-score for independent samples. Well. For larger datasets, as we discussed before, we can use some distance-based metric, for example, Westerstein distance or uh, Jensen-Shannon divergence, and that's how the results of comparison looks like. And finally, let us touch the topic of univariate and multivariate drift detection approach. Because univariate drift detection, detection approach help us to compare individual variables, for example, important features um, with each other or model's output. In this case, we look at each feature independently and we can easily interpret the result. Because if you have, for example, a thousands of features and we see that two features drifted, then we know exactly what has happened. We know the name of those features and we can explore distribution in more details, right? But imagine if you have like 10,000 or even a hundred of features. In this case, sometimes you just want to have the general decision whether your dataset has changed significantly or not. And in this case, you can move from the univariate drift detection to the multivariate. And luckily, there are quite a lot of approaches which can help you with that. For example, you can use some um, model-based drift like binary classifier, which will try to distinguish between the reference data and the current data in general. So basically, you build a model to solve binary classification problem, but instead of the labels, you use like reference or current label. So basically, if your model will be able to distinguish between the reference and current data, so probably there are some signal which helps model to do that. And this means that your data has changed significantly. But be careful, because if you leaked some data related to time, for example, or maybe something else, then you might easily like trick yourself by making a good model, which doesn't really rely on the important and meaningful features. So it's always important to at least take a look on feature importance, where you build your binary classifier to compare reference and current dataset. There are some solutions based on the univariate um, feature distributions, which can help you to figure out whether the whole dataset has drifted. For example, you can track the share of drifted features. In this case, you use the univariate approach to detect drift for each individual feature, but you send an alert only if the significant share of features drifting. For example, you can combine both approaches and, well, use the individual distribution drift detection for very important features, and if your important features are drifting, send an alert for each individual feature, and together with that, measure the share of the whole features which are drifting and send an alert if, for example, more than 30% or 40% or 50% of your features drifting. This will help you to cover for both very important features and overall changes in your dataset. Here are some tips which I also want to share with you regarding drift calculation. So first is then data quality is the must. And well, quite often you might face the drift if there are some bugs or issues with the data quality. This is why it is better to start from data quality. If And if you have no data-related metrics, then first should be data quality metrics, and only after you implemented such checks, move to a data drift. When we calculate drift, we can face different situations. For example, you can build a very good model on top of a small amount of important features, or you can build a very good model on top of the large amount of like weak and non-interpretable features. Those are just an examples. And the approach of drift analysis might quite differ. For example, in the first case, you can measure drift individually and alert on each individual drift because your features are very strong and interpretable. 
But if you have a lot of uninterpretable and weak features, in this case, you might create an alert for share of drifted features. Or if you have a mixed approach, you can, for example, select some very important features, have individual drifts for those features, and measure for the share of drifted features in general. Sometimes it's very important to take into account the segments and, for example, measure drift not for the whole dataset, but for a segment individually. Let's take a look at the, at the example of the quality predict prediction in manufacturing, for example, in steel production. In this case, you might use the raw material from different suppliers. And in this case, if the share of materials you buy from different suppliers differ a lot, you will detect a data drift, but the data could stay the same. And solution here is split the data by the suppliers and measure drift for each supplier independently. In this case, if you, for example, see that there are some drift for specific suppliers, you might conclude that probably the quality of, of raw materials or maybe other property has changed. So drift monitoring per segment also makes sense for quite a lot of problem statements. Well, we discussed a lot about what is data drift, why to measure it, and how to detect data drift. The next will be practical part, where we are going to try our hands and detecting drift using Python.